Just want to thank John for all that singing, singing in that today. Uh, he's really coming out of his shell and trying to get him motivated to do other things, and he's willing to step forward and, and, and help out. The song that I asked him to sing, and that is, as you know, is one of my favorite songs in the songbook. And there's a, re and there's a reason for it um, that it's one of my favorite ones. One is I learned it in high school. Uh, in a, in, we had, in high school I was part of an ensemble made up of about 16 uh, girls and guys. And this was the elite of Columbia High School. The, the elite singers that, you know, and this choral director, Norman Choice, would come in and he would bring a lot of the spiritual songs and that and we, he would have us learn those spiritual songs and then expect us to go out that evening and sing these spiritual songs to the audience that or wherever we were going to be going for that for that night and this song really affected me as a person because he was so energetic and so just you know and this song here really gets you out of your comfort zone and it gets you motivated and gets you fired up and that's what music does to an individual as to today, I just want to review a little bit about worship, and I've, I've kind of like summed up a lot of this stuff to try to bring us back to this where we're at in, in forms of worship and the different uh, functions of worship. And worship, as we know, is is the fear of God, is the beginning of wisdom, and the walk in His wisdom. Is where we obey, serve, and hold fast to His Word and His commands. Having a true heart. It's where we draw near to Him. We're also to stir up love and good works. But mostly, it's about Christ and what He did for me by dying on the cross. Not letting anyone steal your joy in this by doctrines of men and additional regulations and it's about pleasing God and Christ as we know whenever we come here part of the worship is it's not about me who is here God is here all of this is all part of worship of our Lord and Savior we also looked at the Lord's table in worship Robert did an outstanding job and tried to get you in that proper mindset about what Christ did on that cross for you as an individual by his body there if you can actually visualize Christ hanging on the cross and Robert there's some things that he's made mention in the past that there's some things that are just he has a really hard time in dealing with and whenever you stop it you know he said it like the the movie The Passion and stuff like that where you get to the point where you're actually seeing Christ being beaten and flogged and you hear the crack of the whip and you see Christ there on that cross and how emotional that is in that you know so those are things that whenever you think about the Lord's table and he says the New Testament Christ created a new covenant to take the old one away how do I prepare myself is a question. It's a self-examination. Consider others in order to stir up love. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ. Then we also talked about preaching in worship. We are, we are God's workmanship. It means we were created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Preaching is to make us complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory. It's not our glory that we get from doing these works. 
It's the glory in our faith that we share with people to help them to get motivated, to help them to realize the hope that you have in, in Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection. Prayer and worship we also looked at. It says God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus is through prayer that we confess our sins, our trespasses to one another, and we pray for one another. It's through prayer we confess. His prayer also helps in our weaknesses. For even when we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings that, which cannot be uttered. He who searches the hearts knows what the minds of the Spirit is because He makes intercessions for the saints. It's important even through, through prayer that we realize how important that is, that, that it builds strength and confidence. And if you see, there's a pattern that's, a, that's that's being developed in this worship. Each one of these talks about stirring up love, talks about drawing near to, to, to Christ, doing things that, that will help us as an individual and also as a, as a group to draw closer to, to Christ and to God. Music and worship is another avenue of worship. Today I'm not going to really get too involved about the history of music and too so far out in the weeds and that. I just want to present just some things that are so simple and clear to help you understand about music and worship. Some of the questions that, that went through my mind in preparing, is it okay to use instruments in worship? What kind of instruments were acceptable in the Old Testament and the New Testament? How do I worship God properly with music? And that's that question that I said, how do I? So always I want to help you as an individual to maybe look within yourself, how do I personally worship God through, through music? In Exodus, in the Old Testament, it says, Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord, and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea, the Lord is my strength and song, and He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise Him, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. Singing to the Lord. Because He is my strength and song. Did you know the Israelites, whenever they left Egypt, they were looking back and they saw the Pharaoh and his armies approaching them and the helplessness that they probably felt at that time. They said, oh man, you just, Moses, you drug us out here to the wilderness only to be killed by the Egyptian army. But God, through his infinite wisdom and power, they were able to go across that sea on dry ground and the children of Israel were saved because of what God did for them. And here they said that they will sing to the Lord. Some of the... I'm going to go back a little bit. Songs throughout history. Each, each one of us may have a favorite song. Songs that put chill bumps on you as an individual. Some songs that, whenever they're sung, brings up a lot of memories. 
there are some uh, songs that I that I think of whenever I hear the the song that sung uh, out there, uh, the national anthem, and it's sung in a cappella, and it's really they they put their everything that they got into that song. That just puts chill bumps on me as an individual. And then there's also songs. I have a couple of uh, artists that I, that I really like to hear whenever I listen to Christian music. One is Chris Tomlin. The other one is Casting Crowns. And there's a song that Casting Crown that they sing that I, every time that I hear, I, you almost get it really emotional. And that is, um, it, in paraphrasing it, it's about how deep is Jesus' love for you as an individual. It is far as the east and what it is from the west. But they go on as, and, and they say, it's from one scarred hand to the other. And whenever... It's a dual meaning. It, mean, it means that Christ's love for me as an individual can stand from the east to the west. How far is that? It's from one scar hand to the other. And whenever you stop and think about that as an, in, as an individual, you're hearing these words that really... It does something inside here. It does something up in here. And it, what it does, it tries to bring you back closer to God and drawing back near to Him. Then we'll also, too, in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 16, and then 28 to 29, King David said, David spoke to the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be singers accompanied by instruments of music, <coughs> string instruments like harps and cymbals by raising their, the voice with resounding joy. Thus all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn, with trumpets and with cymbals, making music with string instruments and harps. And it happened as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David that Micah, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David whirling and playing music, and she despised him in her heart. This really has a visual connotation. Here King David, he's trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem and to, to really, he wants to make this a, as a dramatic and uh, something that's really, really important to him. So what does he do? He goes to the Levites. Do you know, are, you know they control the, the temple and the sacrifices and that tribe. And he talks to them and he has singers and uh, people that play harps and, and cymbals. And where's David? David's at the back, and he's having a grand old time. He's just, you know, having the time of his life. Dan, you know, whenever you start to stop to think about uh, this, and, and then all of a sudden, the last statement, I really kind of, whenever I saw this, I was like, wow. Saul's daughter looked at David playing music, and, and she despised him with a heart. It's that envy. Whenever you see somebody having a lot of joy in, in what they were doing, but yet somebody still had a problem and, and despised them in their heart. Again, it's joyous here. First Chronicles 16, verse 23 to 24 says, Sing to the Lord all the earth, Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare, declare his glory among the nations. 
his wonders among all peoples. Psalm 33, 2-3 says, Praise the Lord with a heart. Make melody to him with the instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. Psalm 59, 16-17 But I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. For you have been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. To you, O my strength, I will sing praises, for God is my defense, my God of mercy. As you can see throughout this, there's instrumental music that's being brought in to, to the things that are going on, and it's all acceptable by God. It's not commanded or said it has to be done this way. But in the Old Testament, it's something that, that's acceptable. And here, we see that, that whenever they did, they played skillfully. That means that they knew what they were doing. They knew how to play that instrument. It wasn't something that uh, maybe I might hit the right note, the wrong note, hmm. Maybe I know how to play this instrument or not. It's they played skillfully. That means they practiced. They did everything that they could to make sure that whenever they did this, that, that it was in a professional manner. Also to Psalm chapter 66, verse 4. This is a, a psalm in which it's a chief musician. And it's a song of a, of a song. It says, All the earth shall worship you and sing praise to you. They shall sing praises to your name, Selah. And if you notice in the Psalms, you'll see that word, Selah, quite a bit. It's mentioned about 74 times, according to the research that I said. And a lot of people, they don't really know what the word Selah is. There's and I'm going to give you some of the def definitions of terminology that, that has, uh, in the research that I had, says it's a musical direction, and it's usually at the end. Uh, but again, the set definition is not really known. But it's a measure carefully the, to reflect upon the preceding statement. So it's like it's telling you that we're ending it here, but you really need to be reflecting on the words that were just made mentioned before. So it's trying to put emphasis on what was just said. So, and also to Psalm chapter 95, verse 1 to 2. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Isaiah 38, 20. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore we will sing my songs with string instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. Again, the Old Testament, it, it doesn't have any strict regulations that you can't and you, you can and you can't. But whenever here the Old Testament, it's sort of an acceptable uh, pr you know, practice in that to use instrumental music. In the New Testament, you'll find something a little bit differently than all the readings that we'll have today. It's a little bit different. And there's a, there's a reason for it. The reason is, what is your instrument? It's your voice. It's your heart. It's an attitude. It's things that we're so, so the praise and stuff like that, it's supposed to come from within. In James chapter 5, verse 13, 
It says, Is any among you suffering? Let them pray. If is anyone cheerful, let them sing psalms. I don't know about you, but I've been uh, around whenever people, especially kids, I want to say DJ for, for one, I can remember him being in the shower one time and we're sitting out in the living room and boy he's in the shower and what is he doing? Just a singing away. And he's just having the joyous time of his life. And that's sometimes people whenever they get in the shower they do sing a lot because it is something that's refreshing. Because they're cheerful, they're glad and they sing. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Think about Paul and Silas there in the middle of the prison, being guarded, being under trial and persecution, and suffering. And what were they doing? Singing psalms. Singing hymns. At moments in which I'd be looking over at Silas and say, how, how are we going to get out of this? You know, my life may end tomorrow. But hey, I'm going to be happy and glad. I'm going to be sitting here and singing as, as much as what I can. Then we go on in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 to 20. Where it says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is, it talks about making melody in our hearts. Singing that song within ourselves. Praising God. Praising our Heavenly Father. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Again, a a reference about your heart to the Lord. Doing everything within yourselves to let God know your feelings and your emotions. And then finally Hebrews chapter 2 verse 12. It says, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praises to you. That's really Psalms chapter 22 verse 22. If you notice, if you go and you try to look for singing and instrumental music and stuff like that within the New Testament, you're not going to find a lot, you're not going to find anything about instruments in the New Testament. You will find quite a bit in the Old Testament, but not in the New Testament. That process is different. Our voice, our heart, is the instrument. Singing and making melody in your heart, being, letting God know He is our audience. We are here to tell God and Christ how we feel, how we're praising Him. And the song and the music that we utilize is to, for that purpose. And it's our vocal music that, that we use. There's another thing too that I, I want to make mention. Well, how do I, as an individual, sing and make melody in my heart? If I just sit there, and I'm supposed to be participating 
with an audience singing to God. To all of them. Sit there and go, wow, let's sing. La, 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 la. Very quiet. Or do I, as that song that I tried to, I told John to, to sing, is to get you out of your comfort zone, to make you feel like you want to be here to worship God. <coughs> Get, get you really motivated and fired up to get, help God to see how excited that you are for being here. Can I carry a tune? Probably about half, maybe three fourths of us probably can't carry that tune. Can all of us sight read music? Are all of us some somebody that's that's study music knows how to probably play a piano or organ or, or Play a musical instrument. Probably, I don't even know how to play a musical instrument. I know how to sight read. I've done a lot of stuff in my past that has helped me to do what I do and to know what I know. And that's where part of that music is, is to try to get you to say, hey, I'm here. I want to participate. I want to be excited about singing God's praises. And even if I'm not carrying the proper tune, I'm here singing as hard as I can and as loud as I can. Because I want God to hear me and to realize too there's something about singing that's going to be carried over. If you don't like doing it here, well, guess what's going to happen in heaven? You're going to be singing and making melody in your heart to God because of what He's done for you and the redemption that we have in Christ Jesus. So the next time we sing a song, think about the words that are there. Think about being loud and energetic. People feed off of that. People also feed off of quiet, timidness, and being shy. But someone that's energetic and, and excited, people want to be around those type of people. Our worship with music is that we sing with a passion. We're to have a purpose, a feeling, it's emotion. And think about the words and the music that we're singing to God. Is it acceptable? And we need to realize too, where the Bible says something that we readily accept it. Where the Bible is silent as well too. We have to accept that God didn't say yes we can or no we can't in the New Testament. But there's nothing there. Whereas in the Old Testament, there is. In the New Testament, there's not. So if it doesn't say anything about it, then why would we want to take that risk and chance of bringing something into our worship service that may or may not be acceptable to God? And to think first that our voices are an instrument. That's the instrument. And that really is what I wanted to present to you today as an individual about music and worship. And there's a lot of good music that's out there. A lot of new songs I would like to bring in to our worship service. And maybe I will, maybe I can't. But these are some songs that, I, that whenever I sing, I really... It touches me. And maybe music touches you as an individual too. Some songs that you, favorite songs that you might have. Uh, so that's where, as an individual, I want to get you to, is to understand 
the importance of music in worship and carrying that over into our worship service. And then each and every week that we gather together, we always offer an invitation. The invitation is for those that are not in Christ and want to be buried with Christ in, in the watery grave of baptism, to be raised out of that watery grave a new person. That's day one. And there's a song about, out there about day one. It's from that day forward that you said you're going to change your life and you're going to walk faithfully with God and to be with God. But yet, the world out there is rough and tough and the devil is doing its very best to drag you back away from God. And He's going to test you as an individual each and every day. He doesn't have to test the world. He doesn't have to persuade the world. He already has the world in His hands. It's you that He doesn't have. And He's going to do everything possible to get you in His, in his camp. The invitation is for you. If you're subject to that invitation, would you come forward and stand and sing the song of invitation?